Thanks, everyone. That was, uh, that was our last film. I feel kind of sad, actually. It's like the official end to that expedition has finally arrived now that you've seen it. Um, so I want to take questions, um, but before I do, I would like Ben to stand up for a moment. Ben is our project manager. He's been indispensable to Blue Legacy. And um, of course, my beautiful mom is here, my wonderful husband, Fritz, so, um, and a lot of other friends, so thanks for coming. Um, please, questions. I would love to have a conversation about, about this. Yes, young man. Is it really true that all of the um, pesticides uh, sewage treatment run off into the bay when it's simply overloaded with water. I don't see how, how, how such a powerful system could break down from a large amount of water during a rainstorm. That's a great question. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, and Ed can probably answer overflow better than I can, but Simply put, and correct me if I'm wrong, simply put, sewage overflow is basically, um, we have one system for sewage, and that system also um, tries to deal with a, a big amount of water when it rains or when it snows and, and that snow melts. And what happens is all of that extra water overwhelms the system and it, uh, it can't push it to the water treatment facility. So whatever the treatment facility can't deal with ends up in our river. And uh, there's not much we can do about it once it's released into the environment. Is there anything you'd like to add, Ed? All right. Any other questions? What do you think would be the main cause of the pollution in the Potomac River? Uh, which river? The Potomac River. I'm going to pass this one to Ed because he's... He... There are so many causes, but if we, had to ju if we have to say one, the one that is the majority is what, is what Chuck Fox said, the first of the Chesapeake Bay czars that the EPA had. It's agriculture. Agriculture, to grow crops, we need, there is... They have to use a lot of pesticides to keep the pests away from the crops. They have to use a lot of nutrients to make the crops grow. Between the two of those, that's really enough. But the, and then, in a lot of cases, agriculture does allow a lot of erosion, where the cows will damage the bank coming into the streams directly when that's not really a good policy anymore with all the, with all the cows that exist and, and the way it damages them. So it's, it's agriculture, but you can't really blame agriculture because in many ways, it's here, it's all of us. We're all polluters in our own, in our own way. But if you wanted that one big one, we'd have to say agriculture. Yes. Uh, you've, you have uh, created a very impressive and inspiring film, or you in some cases maybe depressing, but uh, I would hate to think that this is the last time it's seen. Is it going to be able to go to schools and other organizations to be shown? That's um, my, yes, that, that is what I plan to do. Um, generally, we produce our films while we're on the road. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to go out and have a wonderful experience in the field because you know, my, my mom um, and my father, they, they took me on my first expedition to Easter Island when I was just over three months old. So I think I grew up on expedition um, and imprinted on men with red watch caps and speedos and diving equipment like a baby bird imprints on its mother. When I'm in the field, I'm happy. I, I feel at home. It's exciting. We're, um, working as a team and having adventures and going new places and talking with inspiring people. It's, it's what I love most. And so I didn't want to go and have this experience and make it into a one-hour film. I wanted to 
share the stories every day. And so generally these films are screened online as we travel. We um, air it to actually, the purpose um, of Blue Legacy is to tell these stories. And so because that's our mission, we're, we're a nonprofit, we give these stories away for free. So our films are licensed to National Geographic, Mother Nature Network, and a whole host of other big websites. But we also make these films and our photographic libraries available to river keepers and other water conservation groups that we work with in the field. We encourage people to post them on their Facebook page and, and um, on their personal blogs. We, try to air them and screen them at schools and um, make sure that teachers know that they're available. And um, I just was talking with uh, my brother, Philippe, who has an organization that works um, on youth education. So we're gonna make all of our films available to him to push out through Discovery Education and, and his network of thousands and thousands of educators across the country. So this film, um, generally, our, our media um, in, in the press and online gets millions of impressions and, and views um, around the world in lots of different diffuse ways that we can't always track, but we know it's out there. Sometimes journalists will use a film like this as secondary content to their articles. That's, I, I want it to go out there and feed conversation and seed, seed the internet with, with this. Yes. Um, when I got out of college, I joined a, a watershed council, uh, one of the old New England ones, and, and I realized in the 80s, they were through the Clean Water Act, there were many uh, citizen groups through the Clean Water Act uh, organizing in, in local watersheds, probably hundreds and maybe a, you know thousands in the U.S. And I wondered if you've been tracking whether they're growing or waning or you know, how strong these very local citizen-driven groups are. Well, um, I haven't been tracking them, but you bring up a really important point. You know, as I look around at the kinds of stories that we're telling about water, we're telling more and more stories, which is great. And a lot of them are films like Last Call at the Oasis, which is a participant media film, which will be screened tomorrow. Um, Jessica Yu, who's an amazing filmmaker, made this film, and I hope you will all see it. Um, these are important, con you know, conversation-shaping films, and they talk about the issues in a very broad stroke, helping us understand what we're facing. What I want to do is actually activate, validate, and empower local watershed conservation groups by telling their stories and traveling to different hotspots around North America and around the world, making films like this and making these films available to those groups so that they can tell their story to their communities, get their communities involved to help shape and support um, uh, local legislation to help make sure that uh, we aren't dumping in our rivers, to make sure that they can tell their story to donors and sponsors and raise more money. All of those things, I think, are more powerful when we have strong stories behind us. And I want to tell those stories, um, as, as this is a story about that as well. So um, there are, like, Waterkeeper Alliance and river networks that gather them together and empower them, but I don't know if we're tracking them the way you said, but we should be. Thank you. Yes. In addition to um, giving money to water keeper, or, uh, river keepers and other conservation groups um, and supporting legislation, as you say, what individually, in terms of our actions in our homes, in the city and in suburbia, do you want us to think about in terms of saving the rivers? Thank you for that question. Um, it's, a lot of people will say, um, they'll give you five tips, you know, turn off your tap when you brush your teeth and make sure you only use your dishwasher and other appliances when they're full and use a cover on your pool and get a rain barrel and all these other things. And those are all really important things to do, of course. Um, but 
I actually think that we can't just blindly do things that are going to help without really understanding why we're doing it. And water is a global issue, but it's also a local issue. And I believe that the best way to know what to do in our life, in our home, in our backyard, in our community, is to know where our water comes from. Do any of you know where your water comes from? Other than that? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a question that a lot of people can't answer. And um, knowing where your water comes from, knowing what happens to it as it passes through your community and through your life, and where it goes when it leaves your community, if you can answer those questions, then it becomes clear where the threats are and where you can take action individually. And again, I'll, I'll point you back to Ed. Um, if you want somebody to answer those questions, my understanding is that river keepers will not only tell you, but they'll show you. And I suggest if you can, go out on a patrol and, and see what's happening to the Potomac River. You can watch films about it, but as somebody who's been out there, it's not nearly as powerful to watch it as it is to experience it. Go touch your water, experience your water, take your kids, go kayaking, go canoeing, go catch frogs, go look for tadpoles. I love doing these things still. <laughs> I can't wait till my daughter gets old enough I can take her to catch some tadpoles. Um, but we want to make sure that we have streams and lakes and rivers that are healthy enough to support tadpoles and frogs. It's healthy enough for our children to go swimming in, to drink the water from, to eat the fish from. And um, groups like Ed's will, will help you understand what you can do specifically. Have you in any of your stories oh. any examples of places where people have actually... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, I, sorry. Okay. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, one question. What really concerned me the most was the pharmaceutical drugs. Um, there is no way to monitor or even clean this stuff out, especially since it's a $330 billion industry. As many pharmaceutical drugs that are being ingested in our system, what can we do and what aren't we doing to, to get that stuff out of our water? And are you going to plan on doing something involved with the pharmaceutical industry in our water system? Thank you for that question. I, I think there's a couple of things that actually we can do because it seems like uh, it makes me feel powerless when I think about the 80,000 untested chemicals that we're pumping into our environment without really understanding, you know, what it's doing to us um, and especially what it's doing to our children. You know, I think about that when I look at my seven-month-old daughter. Um, there's a couple of things I think we all should be doing. One is we need to recycle, and not just plastic bottles. We need to recycle batteries. We need to make sure that we don't dump our, our drugs, our, our pharmaceutical drugs, down the drain or flush them down the toilet. You can actually take them to CVS or Rite Aid, and they will recycle them for you. Um, that's very important because those drugs do end up in the river. Um, we need to make sure that we're not dumping paint thinner and, and motor oil not only down our drains, but, but down, down our sewers. Hmm? Question. That's really important. And I think the other thing is just listen for legislation that is being passed. Oftentimes, we don't invest in our infrastructure. It's not a sexy issue. It's not one that anybody really wants to support. But our tax dollars need to go into helping make sure that our infrastructure is dealing with that. And we can adjust our water treatment facilities to also start filtering out s some of these other um, substances, not just human waste. So we need to invest in that as a community and, and that's something that we need to vote for, we need to be heard on, um, and it's something we all need to participate in. Okay. Yes. As a uh, former friend of the Shenandoah River and soon to be friend of the Potomac, <laughs> I've witnessed some of the uh, agricultural problems that we have, primarily on the Potomac where cattle are allowed in the river, a herd in the river, down the bank, you know, walking around. Is there an effort in Virginia to stop that um, through riparian buffer zones or fencing? I am going to um, pass the mic to Ed. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Okay, he will answer that okay. later. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.